The video you're about to watch has been designed to take you deeper, higher, and wider into Yahweh. Enjoy and please subscribe. Thank you. Liquid gold. 
with all the diamonds and rubies and lightning and thunder and life in it. I want you to stand on that mountain tonight and remind yourself that Yahweh wants to take you on a journey of growth. He wants to shift you in to the dimensions and realms. He wants to open up your life. He wants to pour into you realms and dimensions of, of love, hope, faith, honor, favor. He wants to show you Zoe life. And he wants to again take you on a journey where he pours everything onto you and over you. So the expansion of your spirit man can affect your soul and your body. Remind yourself that we worship an infinite, phenomenal, beautiful, incredible God that has called us to come upon, to, to come where He is, to live where He lives, to have our being in Him, to live and move in Him, to be covered by Him, to be overshadowed by Him, for His breath to breathe in and over you daily, for His presence to consume you. And you're on this mountain with Him, and both of you start ascending, descending into the mountain. I want you to find yourself in that valley that we've been in over the last couple of weeks. You understand that there's six doors on one side, six doors on the other side. The valley is almost like I would say inside out. You've got parts of nature flowing through it, but you also have the beautiful furniture of an inside room of a multi-trillionaire, if I can put it like that. Just the most beautiful things, the most incredible things you've ever seen. And these angelic beings that uh, stand by these doors, wants to take you into the chamber. Now we've gone through several of these chambers already. We've done uh, the angel of Agape, the angel called Agape, and we've walked through his door into his chamber, and it was the chamber of love. We've gone through hope into the chamber of hope. We've gone through faith into dimensions of faith, starting with our very beginning, uh, our very beginning encounter of faith was our, was our salvation. And then we started growing in faith as we said, if we meditated on the word, we start growing in the gift of faith, we start growing and maturing in the fruit of faith, we begin to shift and we begin to add value to each dimension of faith as we went into it. We are reminded that we walk through favor, it's a different being, I, I would go as far as to say it wasn't an angelic being, it was, it was a living creature within the kingdom of heaven and we get to walk through him and as you walk through, through uh, uh, honor, you, you see how the gateways and the doorways of creation opens up for you. We begin to understand that honor is the key to every doorway within the kingdom of heaven. We are reminded that we walked into the room, into the chamber of favor, where favor overshadowed us, and favor began to literally shift us into that place where the Father shows you, you are the head, not the tail. You are blessed, not cursed. No weapon formed against you can prosper, as he lifts you and shifts you to a higher, deeper, wider place in life and in him. We've gone through the door of life. gone through the door of realms. And as you enter into that chamber, if you can remember last week, there was many different realms around you that you can choose to go into either of them. And of course, you want to remind yourself that in your engagement during the week, you want to choose different, different realms to go into. The Father wants to open our eyes to see what's out there. He wants to show you what the enemy has taken from us and what we need to claim back, what we need to go into and take back. The enemy has mountains and thrones that does not belong to him. He has covenants over certain areas in, in the world that does not belong to him. The cosmos does not belong to the enemy. The stars, the sun, the moon, the planets does not belong to the enemy. Nothing out there uh, has the, 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 the name of Satan written on it. The only thing that has his name written on it is the bottom of my foot. <laughs> so we need to take back what belongs to us. Tonight I want you to go into this chamber called Dimensions. Now we're slowly but surely beginning to understand that every level of theology that we have touched base on, whether it is salvation, whether it's restoration, whether it's the cross, whether it is the blood, whether it is the word of God, whether it is uh, revelations, whether it is um, the fruit of Yahweh, whether it is righteousness, whether it is whichever... You can, whatever you can think of right now, we're beginning to understand that there is dimensions to each of it. 
If I just look at the blood we, we went through and study with me about the blood, and there were so many dimensions to the blood that we, we, we couldn't even fathom it because there are so many uh, dimensions we get to go into. We understand um, three dimensions. As a matter of fact, uh, scientific world still don't really know what the first dimensional um, first dimension is. We understand two-dimensional, we understand three-dimensional, but we are three-dimensional beings, but we have not even touched the dimension of the fourth, the, the, the fourth dimension. We don't understand the lack of time and space. Now we have to understand Yahweh is a multi-dimensional being. The first, uh, 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 six, the seventh, the eighth, ninth, and they say uh, so far men have engaged Yahweh up to 36 different dimensions, and it's infinite, there's more. Tonight, the Father wants to take you to this chamber. <coughs> I want to remind you that Revelation is progressive. We have touched base on dimensions of righteousness, dimensions of faith. We have done dimensions of the blood, dimensions of the word, dimensions of the, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I want you to step into this chamber. As soon as you step into this chamber, it's like there's a shaking that takes place. Like a constant vibration and it goes into your entire being. It almost makes your vision blurry because it shakes all of who you are. But what it does is it separates everything from everything. And I want you to understand this. If I look at faith, all I see is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. But when it starts going through the dimensions of vibration, the dimension of frequency and the kingdom of heaven, it breaks faith up into all the different portions that it's meant to be. So we've done the eight dimensions of faith, but there's even more than that. That's just what the Father has shown me. It's broken up into multiple dimensions, multiple things that we can engage. Because as you grow, things that you have understood and perceived breaks up because of this, this realm, uh, this thing we call dimensions. It breaks open and things start developing in a different form. I want you to stand in this room and I want you to take a, a run through your theology. Take a run through that which you've been taught. Take a run through your understanding and your perception of the Word of God, of the Scriptures, of, of your relationship with Him. His name as Jesus, His name as Yeshua, His name as God, uh, His name as Yahweh, His name as Daddy, as Father, His name as Spirit or Holy Spirit or Holy Ghost. I want you to let all these perceptions and understandings that you have regarding who this incredible God is, bring them into this chamber. And let the vibration start breaking them up. And then I want you to start in your time, your own personal time. I need you to start engaging each one of these little portions of, of our faith, our little, little portions of revelations we have, and let it be broken up into portions. Let me tell you something. That's what's, that's what's happened to me over the last eight years. That my the theology that I've had, the revelation I've carried, was breaking, broken up into small little portions. And each little part that broke off became a whole other dimension of truth to me. And I believe it was this chamber I engaged called Dimensions. As you step into this chamber, there's a river like all the others that flows through the fountain. The fountain is not quite water. It's almost almost like, I don't know exactly how to explain it. It is water, but it has that the rippling effect when you throw a stone in the water, but it's almost like it's in the air. It's like the whole room shakes, the whole room vibrates. It looks like there's heat in the room, if you understand what I'm talking about. Like when you drive on a highway, it's really warm and it looks like the road's wet. It's almost like that effect that's in it. And it's representing the, uh, the idea behind there's a, a second dimension and a third dimension and a fourth dimension and the Father wants to begin to teach you about everything else that we cannot perceive in the natural. The, the, the main focus I believe the Father has his people to engage right now is space and time. Let's begin to understand what it means to travel at the speed of light because we live in the light, the fullness of the light, not created light, creative light. 
As a matter of fact, as we enter into this chamber of dimensions, this is what we step into. We're stepping into the fourth dimension. I talked a little bit about this timeline before, and I want you to go into that dimension where there's no time and space for you. Now I want you to start going into experiences in your life that was negative, things that you engaged, things that engaged you, that messed you up, that changed your ideas, your perception, that changed your faith, things that need to be aligned. I want you to go in to every experience that you feel in your heart was an accusation made against you by the enemy, uh, something that brought an attack against your blood, not on yourself, financially, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, socially, something that, that harmed you and that caused you to think the way you think today, caused you to be in the situation that you are today. Uh, and this is what this fourth dimension does. You get to go back into your timeline and deal with these things in the courts right now so that by the time you get back to your today, which of course we understand we learn our tomorrow today, by the time you come back to your today, it's been dealt with. Your yesterday has been dealt with and your today is aligned with your tomorrow. That's what I love about this fourth dimension called time and space. But I know that some of you are thinking to yourself, I have no idea what you're talking about. I have no idea how to do this. But remember, and I remind you of this, your mind, your, your, your imagination has to be activated because it is the eyes of your soul. We do not see in the spirit because the eyes of our soul is shut. So we open the eyes of our soul through activating our imagination, which, is, which, is, which literally means um, my inward sight. So it's that which my spirit has so desperately wanted to reflect into my soul so that I can see what my spirit's doing. So this is what's happening right now. In this chamber, there is that dimensional, constant dimensional shift taking place where the Father is looking at you to reveal to you the things that you can align from your yesterday to bring into your today. Allow the Father to bring you through your yesterday into your today, meaning Change your yesterday into what it was meant to be for today. Break those walls. Don't allow the enemy to hold you back because of what happened in your past. Align your past. Now I want to remind you, you have the capacity to look into your tomorrow and live in your tomorrow today. When you live in your tomorrow today, nothing the enemy brings to you can bring harm to you because if you live in your tomorrow today and you've seen your tomorrow and you're in your today, then nothing can take you out of your today because you're living in your tomorrow. Well, I know that sounds like a Lamborghini, but I need you to understand this, this chamber of dimensions uh, is literally to shift you out of your way of thinking, to propel you into another place. I've experienced this in my life so many times, it's mind-blowing. Matter of fact, less than a week ago, I found myself living in my today instead of living in my tomorrow. Well, that sounds well, uh, that's how we all live. But see, I've been living in my tomorrow for a very long time. But when you live in your today, you look at the circumstances that you face right here, right now. And then that simply just changes the way you think. It affects you because of your yesterday. But if you live in your tomorrow, if you live in that dimension where the Father has already spoken over you, where the Father has already reflected who you are into you, where He's already shown you where you're going, what you're going to be doing, where He's already shown you every step you need to take to get to where you need to go, then your today is not something you focus on. Because let me tell you something, you can look at yourself right now and not be impressed 
not be happy. As a matter of fact, right now you want to give up. Right now you want to say this is it. it's not working. Right now I don't want to carry on. Right now I'm not getting the increase I was promised. Right now things are not falling into place. Right now me and my husband are not working out. Right now my children are not listening or obeying. My, and right now my children are failing in school. Right now I'm not being uh, taken to a higher place in my workplace. Right now I just don't like what I'm seeing. I want to give up. Because you're living in your today. But if I live in my tomorrow, I am reminded constantly of what Yahweh said. So you don't give up on your promise until it's fulfilled. Because most of the time we give up and then the very next day that promise was meant to be fulfilled. But because you were not in your tomorrow and in your today, the, that which was meant to come through for you is blocked. That's why this chamber of dimensions is incredibly life-changing. And I know this is a whole different way of coming towards what I'm doing right now. And I understand if you're new to this class, it's probably freaking you out a little bit. But Yahweh needs us to begin to understand. We're not operating on this side of the veil. We're not trying to deal with things on this side of the veil. We're in a dimension we call the spirit realm, the kingdom of heaven, where all things are revealed, where we can see everything before it happens, where he shows us our tomorrow every day, where he reflects his presence and his glory in and over us every day where all his fullness is in me and I become a son, a daughter, I become an oracle, I become a legislator, I'm a king, a priest, I walk with him, I engage with the seven spirit, he shows me my life in its full capacity and what I see in my today is not the same as what I see in my tomorrow. Father, I want to ask you in the name of Yeshua right now that you would start opening up our eyes. Let's begin to see and perceive the things that these dimensions, this chamber opens up. Because I know we start sometimes just don't understand it. We want to hold on to the old school way of doing things, the, the old way of seeing things. But there's so much more that you've opened up for us. There's a dimension around that we get to live in that overshadows so much, that removes so much, that realigns so much, that, that re reestablishes so much. And of course it brings change, it brings us to a governance, it brings us to a place of absolute rulership, co-ed with you, not just in creation, but in all of what you have created. And of course your desire for us to be whole, see the capacity we have to live it out tomorrow. That's what dimensions opens up. Now I want you to keep experiencing this, keep engaging with this chamber as much as you can. Slowly we're going to come out of this chamber. Remind yourself, once you walk out of the door, the angel that's guarding this door is going to place a mantle of dimensions over your shoulders. Now up to this point, you have love, hope, faith, honor, favor, life, realms, and dimensions over your shoulders. I think you understand something. You are no longer the same. You are a different being than what you were six weeks ago or eight weeks ago. You might not see it right now. You might not perceive it. You might think, looks like you're just making this stuff up. It's not real. But I've experienced this and I need you to understand. We are spirit beings. We are spirit beings. Once you get born again or born from above, you are no longer a human being. You are a spirit being. You are a son of light. You are the fullness of Yahweh and His image and likeness. Things change. I am a spirit. That, that has a soul and a body that lives in my spirit, man. And the Holy Spirit lives in my body. I'm consumed with the fullness of Yeshua because I live in Him. But I also live and move and have my being in the fullness of yod Hey vav Hey. I live in the kingdom of heaven. I'm no longer off this earth. So slowly as we ascend back to the mountain of gold, I want you to find yourself coming into the atmosphere. I want you to stop breathing this revelation. If you just received, I want you to breathe every dimension that came into you and over you, every every realm, every part of life, every part of favor, uh, honor, faith, hope, love. I want you to pour and breathe it into the city. Breathe it into your family. Breathe it, breathe it into your household, into your workplace. Release it. As a spirit being, you have that capacity. Expand your spirit man over your workplace. Expand it over your children's school. Expand it over your, your little town. Expand it over your city. Expand it over your state. Expand it over the entire nation. And breathe the fullness of what the Father's released over you each place. We are legislators. 
We are ones that bring alignment to creation, that we begin to see it, receive it, understand it, and do it. Not so much what we do in the natural. There is a lot we need to be, to be doing in the natural, but the spiritual comes first. We align things in the spirit realm and it begins to affect the natural. We have to begin to believe because it's the unseen that we don't believe. It's the unseen that we have no faith in. It's the only things we see. But that needs to change because the, 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 the company of people that the Father is calling forth will do things in the spirit that will be uh, excessive and overwhelming. And it will be greater things than what he did in the earth. But these things that we will be doing in the spirit will change nations, will change the world as it aligns and propels things into place. We have to begin to believe it because we're already doing it. And Father, it's incredible. We love you. We praise you. We thank you, Yahweh. You're a beautiful, majestic God. In the name of Yeshua. Amen. Can someone possibly go in the back there and put lights on? Sometimes I, uh, for me this stuff is just natural, I've been doing it for eight years now, um, I talk in a specific manner, I say specific things, and, and most people don't always understand the accent. Uh, yesterday, uh, Monday, Sunday, I was talking about a, fr um, a guy that comes from my nation, and in my nation you pronounce his name Kim Clement. In America you pronounce it completely different, because that's uh, the French name, so it's uh, Clement. And nobody had any clue on who I was talking about. So I was like, you, nobody, you guys don't know who Kim Clement is? <laughs> like, no, no one knows who that is. And then eventually one guy clicked and he's like, oh, Kim Clement, Clement. Mm. I'm like, oh, Lord. Okay, so I understand my accent, all different. we say things differently, we pronounce things differently. We even spell some words differently, I mean, you know that. We spell color differently. Actually, wait, wait, the rest of the world spell color different than what Americans do. Color. Yeah. <laughs> color. But, co I don't know how you spell it. It's easier the way you spell it. I actually prefer the way you spell it. Where's the water closet? The water closet? Yeah. I don't know what that is. You know what? This is that. Okay, no, we don't, we don't, I don't know. No one, who we'll calls it that? <laughs> <laughs> no, not in South Africa. <laughs> South Africa, we just speak normal English. <laughs> not American. My, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's a difference between English and American. But then actually, I think it's more just uh, the difference between English and uh, Southern. Right? <laughs> well, I was talking to a guy the other day, and he was saying things, something I couldn't understand. He was saying, Namin, Namin, and I, I thought it was someone's name that he was saying the whole time. Eventually, I figured out, okay, wait, he's actually saying, you know what I mean. <laughs> but yeah, I, I'm, I'm in, at a hotel, and this guy stops like, and he's like, <laughs> I don't know if I should say this in public, but he's swearing. Like, he's in shock. He's like, what the fuck? And that's when he stops. That's what he said. So he's not swearing, he's just saying far, but we know what he's trying to say, right? He's looking at me, he's like, what the far? You are like, and he's swearing at me, but he's not swearing at me, he's just swearing while talking to me, but he's not really swearing because he's not even pronouncing the whole word. So I'm standing there thinking, is he swearing at me? Is he, what's he doing? You know, it's like, the way we talk is just crazy, right? In my house, my wife is English. The whole family is English, and her dad's actually from England. So the pronunciation of words is very important. Um, so, yeah, we have to say something wrong. Like, for example, you know, y'all, it's not a, a word that I'm allowed to use in my house. I use it on purpose to tease my wife, but it's actually a pepper word. My kids are not allowed to use it. Because there's actually no such word, right? But my, my phone says there is such a word. 
Yo. That is you all. Yeah. Push two words together. Yeah. It's a new word, right? I know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> blong. Don't be too long. Yeah, don't blong. <laughs> so what I want to try and do over the next couple of weeks is uh, we've done it before, but it, it's just gone to a deeper place with with the engagement that's been opening up because we're beginning to understand as we engage with the angelic, uh, they engage back. Right? Now, we, we, uh, we don't understand this, although we should understand it, because that's exactly what we've been doing for the last 500 years with the demons. We've engaged with them so much, and they've engaged back so intensely, that the church has found itself on its back several times, being attacked. I hear it all the time. And it's okay. You know, sometimes we do things in the spirit, and the enemy hates it uh, excessively, and he brings uh, demonic entities to come against us, Right? But we understand that, and that happens, and that's okay. But we also have authority over that. I mean, I've been in, in America for five years doing things that I never thought I could do. And the uh, minimal attack on my life, uh, I can't even begin to express to you. Yes, sometimes there's an attack, because uh, it just happens. But, but because I know to the extent that the Father has revealed to me who I am, Satan has no effect in my life. But what I'm trying to say here is, we no longer engage with the enemy right. like we used to. Amen. Right? Because he comes out and he's looking for trouble. Amen. You know, he's making an accusation against you. And it's, uh, it's like in South Africa, I don't know if you have it out here, but, but you go to a bar mainly because you want to get drunk and fight. Maybe pick up a chick. That was the main focus. And, and, so, and where I come from, a little, little mining town, um, the chick's a bonus, but you really just want to go fight. Some of our bars were called uh, golden ropes. Because you step in there and there's going to be a fight. You're going to fight. And it will happen like, did you look at me? Are you checking me out? <laughs> You're like, uh, no, I was looking at your terrible dress thing. <laughs> but there'll be a fight. And it will be the most ridiculous reason. It'll just be crazy. But that's kind of what we did. Satan comes and he's basically telling you, I don't like the way you dress. I don't like your, I don't like your curly hair. I don't like your straight hair. I don't like your round body. I don't like your skinny body. I don't like your whatever. And that's not quite what he does. He comes against your finances. He comes against your health. He comes against you and he's bringing an accusation. And what do we do? Because he's looking for trouble. He's looking for a fight. We give him a fight. And we're slowly beginning to understand that's not quite what Yeshua had in mind. Because if Satan has legal right to bring an accusation against you, then we need to deal with that accusation in that court situation. We have to deal with it legally because if there's legal right, the legal right will get shut. That's why we operate in the courts, in the mobile court, right? But what we've done is because Satan is looking for trouble and we gave him a fight, what we've done is we've excited all the other demons that wanted to attack. And so as we bring them attention, they arise against us. That's why before we know it, there's a whole room full of demons attacking us. You might say, well, I've never experienced that. You lie, you fry. <laughs> Every time you have a great spiritual experience, the very next thing you do is you want to go sin. Oh, not you. I'm sorry. Just me then, I guess. But we're beginning to understand the same principle applies to the angelic. Now, they're not looking for trouble. They want us to engage because they are there for us. They are called to assist us. They are called to help us. Now, I also understand that there has been um, much debate. I remember um, what I usually do is I would announce in my meetings that I greet the angels that's here. You know, I've got angels assigned to our ministry. One specific angel is called Zeskiel, and I've got passion and focus that's with me all the time. And every now and then the Father would bring different angels to uh, come into our ministry and do certain things. I had uh, angels called Marco, which is a warring angel. Markio was an angel of salvation. Manesh, a breakthrough angel. There was mystery. There was revelation of fire angels. There was Noel, which brought alignment. There was uh, Wolverine angels. There was um, Zariel, New Order. There was Grace. And there were several other angels. And still daily I'm engaging with angels. Not because I worship them. Because I'm going to understand you can talk to somebody without worshiping them. Mm -hmm. Or is that not possible? So every time you talk to somebody, you're worshiping them. Because that's kind of what the church believes. 
If you know the name of an angel or you've spoken to an angel, you must worship angels. But I don't understand. That really just makes no sense. Because if we read the Bible, we're beginning to understand that there was hundreds of uh, people or engagements with angels in the, in, the, in, the, in the Bible, right? Matter of fact, the New Testament's got 176 um, engagements with angels or references to angels, and the Old Testament has got 107. That's 283 references to angels just in the Bible. And we also understand that there's more than just the Bible, right? How are you guys doing? So what I'm going to try and do over the next couple of weeks, uh, so we've done this before, so if you've been here from the beginning, uh, we have taught on the angels before. As a matter of fact, the very first time we, 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 um, I did the angels here in this meeting, it was very strange. Um, when I recorded this, I, I used to record on a video camera, and then I would go up to my house and I would download it onto my phone, which I would then later edit through an editing program. And I would always do the exact same thing. But when I was ministering on the angels, the editing program, um, when I put it on YouTube, was flicker. Only myself and, and Margie. Nothing else flickered. Nothing else flickered. Only myself and Margie, when we, as soon as I speak or move, uh, we're flickering in and out. And it happened over two or three sessions that we did just in the angelic. Now as you go back to that exact same uh, message that's still on YouTube, there's no flickering. I don't know, that, that's pretty strange. When you start engaging with the angels, strange things happen. No, they're not, it's not because they want to scare us, but they are excited for our engagement. Because they are there, although their sole purpose is as to be ministering angels to us. They have messages. They're not messages in the sense of, well, God said this and God tells us of this, this and this, so that he can do this, this and this. A message is what I'm bringing you right now. They are literally called to come share revelation with us in many different ways. They are there to propel you in your ministry. They're there to propel you in life. They can bring finances. They can bring insight, wisdom, revelation, knowledge. They can open up doorways, gateways. They can shift you into place. They can align you into the right position. There's so much that they are there to do for us, but we've missed all we want is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. That's right. Now that sounds really great, and it is great, but that's not what the Father wants. We think that if I'm engaging with an angel, or I engage with the seven spirits, or I engage with the 22, uh, 22, 22 letters, or I do something outside of worshipping God, sitting at his feet, then I'm not worshipping God. But he's beginning to reveal to us that that's not the truth. His desire for you is to engage what is out there, what he placed in your way for you to engage. Now I want to remind you before we carry on, you're in him. Because if you're not in him, you can engage an angel of light that's actually a demon. Right. Right. And you can get uh, 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 infused revelation right from the dark side. It can destroy you. Right. That's why we don't engage anything outside of the nine skins. Remember yeah. I said this now. I will continue to remind you of this because this is something you want to judge every encounter you have. So if I'm sitting in my house and all of a sudden something comes into my, into my doorway and it's an angel and I begin to engage with it, I want to judge that encounter with righteousness, joy, and peace. Right. Now, you also understand something. Because of a lack of knowledge, many times peace is removed from an encounter because everything that's dark, everything that looks like um, we can't, anything that looks outside of our perception of what an angel or something heavenly should be like, we want to reject as demonic. But I don't understand, if you have to stand at the throne and engage with a four living creatures, um, it will freak you out. That, those, those guys are freaky. Yeah, they are freaky. So we have to also understand it's in Christ that everything surrounds me in my revelation and understanding because I can engage things because we've always thought well darkness is evil um, anything dark is evil but we understand now no actually darkness is not evil as a matter of fact darkness is the mysteries and the secrets of Yahweh yeah. now that doesn't mean that Satan and his hordes doesn't operate in darkness don't misunderstand me so I need you have to understand you have to have the, the understanding of the difference between the two different darknesses because Satan is, Satan is in darkness. But Yahweh, he hides himself in darkness. 
Now, we don't, we don't like that, but that's fact. And a matter of fact, in his mysteries and secrets in the heavens, is that dark side, is that tender part. It's his, his, his back, not his back side, the back of God, the mysteries, the hidden, the hidden parts of Yahweh that's not been revealed. It's in darkness. As a matter of fact, when he came to the Israelites, he came into a, in a cloud, a dark cloud. Yes. At the crucifixion of Yeshua, there was darkness that came over the face of the earth. And the church teaches us that that was demons. That was the presence of Yahweh, the fullness of who God is, established in the earth. Amen. The slowly, slowly, we're going to be able to get to understand and, and, and have the revelation the followers reveal. But his desire in this time is for you to understand that everything I encounter, I judge through those nine skins. So is my encounter bringing me to a place of righteousness, joy, peace? Is it taking me on the way, truth, and life? Is it taking me to understand justice, judgment, and holiness? Right? That's what you want to judge, whatever you encounter. And that's key because you don't want to encounter something that takes your, your peace, takes your joy, takes up your righteousness, that doesn't enhance your holiness. Everything I've encountered over the last eight years has grown me, has matured me, has shifted me into a deeper place of Yahweh. Of course, you want to know the Word of God. You want to have study and meditate that which is written because you want to have a foundation. Remind yourself daily that the belt it's the truth, and that is what holds everything together, right? Which is the written word, the Logos. Are you guys okay? Yeah. Understand that this generation that we're in, the company of people the Father has called, and I say the company of people that the, the, the Father has called, but it's, it's not even the Joshua generation, it's the generation that comes after the Joshua generation. You know, I believe... Uh, Caleb and Joshua is that, that generation that, that calls forth mountains, that goes and slays dragons, that has equipped and is there to equip the next generation into what the Father is leading us into. Now, that generation is already before us. There's already men that's done the slaying of dragons, and we're still doing that because that's always going to be done. But there's men that started this, there's women that already started this, and we are following in their footsteps. So we are a generation that comes after Joshua and Caleb. Caleb, Caleb, I've been making names here, creating new people. Uh, and so we're beginning to understand that this generation has to work with angels. The previous generation did, but not in its full capacity. Because we couldn't see, or they couldn't see. We can't see all as we should yet, but we're learning to. Now let's see a, a couple of scriptures. It says, now it came, it came about when Joshua uh, was uh, by Jer Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, a man was standing opposite him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or for our adversaries? He said, No, rather I in, in, indeed come uh, now as captain of the host of the Lord. Joshua said to him, what has my Lord to say to his servant? Now first remind yourself that when the Bible refers to this and he looked up or he lifted his head, he wasn't looking up and that's what he saw. He was shifting into the kingdom of heaven. He was shifting into the spirit realm and he saw something that could not be seen with the natural eyes. Right? Yes. Although we can easily read over phrases like this, he lifted up his eyes, it suggests that Joshua was seeing into a different realm, what I mentioned, not in his uh, earthly one. Now, I've, I've touched base on this, but there are at least 283 references to angels in the Bible and more in the New Testament than in the Old Testament. Um, <clears throat> when they appear on the earth, they are often mediators between God and people bringing a message. How many of you understand that? You know, I remember sitting in my lounge, me and my wife were really talking, she was sitting next to me on the couch, and while she was talking to me, um, kind of helps when you're not actually listening with your spirit, but with your soul. 
right, your world mind and emotions. So my wife's talking and I'm responding to her, but my spirit's doing something else. Because while my wife's really talking to me, there's an angel that walks into the door, and my spirit gets up out of my body and goes to the door and engages with this angel. The angel called Noel. Uh, it was at this point, he's standing at my height, I'm six foot one, and we're engaging and talking, and he says to me, I'm going to go with you to the meeting tonight, and we're going to bring alignment. I'm going to stay with you for the next three weeks. Well, this is a couple of years ago, I think maybe two years ago. I went to Dennis Springs that night, and while we were in soaking, I went with, it was with Noel into the atmosphere, and what he did is we expanded to about 150, maybe 200 feet over the city, and he had a staff in his hand. He started hitting the staff into the ground, and uh, it looked like an atom, atom bomb, without the mushroom, if that makes any sense. So the mushroom comes, and then the, the bottom of the mushroom looks like a rippling effect that takes place. What happened is it was bringing alignment. And we did this in every city I had a school in, yes. um, and he did it right all over the place. He was with me for three weeks, incredible time. And right after he left, if you guys can remember, every city that I had a school in, it snowed. You guys remember the snow we had a couple of years ago? It was like, what? Now, I'm not saying that I brought the snow. <laughs> but it's pretty strange that that happened right after alignment took place. Then what is even more interesting is a, about a year later, I'm talking to a, a young man that came from Texas, and he's talking to me about an encounter he had with an angel, listen to this, an angel called Noel, that had a staff in his hand that would stick it into the ground three times and bring alignment. I've never met this guy. He's never met me. And then he said, and it, and it snowed, in Texas. It's never snowed in Texas. Well, I don't know. That's crazy stuff. So I'm, I'm engaging with this angel while I'm sitting with my wife on the couch. So the Father just wants us to understand that there's much happening in the atmosphere that we're not engaging. Because we don't understand what it means to worship Him. Now you say, well, that wasn't worship to God. Well, yes, it was. I wasn't worshiping the angel. I was engaging with the angel, and it was bringing me to a closer place in Yahweh. It was shifting my relationship, and it was making me, uh, a, 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 making me walk in a deeper place of intimacy with him because of what I was engaging with, with, with the angel. Yeah. Yeah, we understand that the word... Angel or angelos in Greek and uh, malach in Hebrew both means messenger. It's not surprising that Joshua expected the angel to have a message. Angels have been around for a very long time, right? They're older than us. Well, you know that. <laughs> also understand that we are the only created being that has a three-strand a three-strand DNA. <laughs> Let me my download there. Five fingers. Four. Okay. Three-strand DNA. Angels only have a two-strand DNA. They can appear as physical, but they don't have the flesh that we carry. They don't have the same DNA. They have soul and they have spirit. Animals have soul and body. We are the only ones with body, soul, and spirit. Because we're made in the image of Yeshua, Yahweh, right? Yes. That's why we're also the only ones that can carry the fullness of who Yahweh is in the earth. Mm -hmm. But his desire for us is to see what the angelic is there for so we can begin to engage them and understand that when I am engaging with an angelic being, it's not because I am worshipping it. Right. You know, um, this is, it happens in all the meetings. As a matter of fact, if you can see in the spirit, you'll understand there's several beings in this room yes. that is not seen with natural eyes. Yes. As a matter of fact, every church has two angels. Yes. And the only reason we don't see them is because we never engage with them. Now, this specific building <coughs> would have several angels because there's ministries in them, more than one yes. ministry. Yes. So as you can see, and of course, this is something we don't understand, but angels come to the meetings because they want to hear what the son is saying. Yes. I remember having meetings in um, Albany, which is the Gathering Place International with Pastor Chuck and Shea. Um, 
Yeah, I, I always say their last name wrong, but I'm just going to go with Dr. Chuck and Shay from the Gathering Place International. That, there is literally a porthole in that ministry for the angels to come in and out. I mean, several times I've been in that meeting and there will be several angels in that meeting. Yeah. Just sitting. I remember while Ma Margie was doing worship and I was, uh, I was about to start preaching and the power just went off. Came back on, went off. Came back on, went off. They three times. And so in the, in the spirit, I went in to see what it was. And it was, uh, let me just see if I can get that angel's name quickly. Mm -hmm. It was Markiel, Markiel. It was a salvation angel that stepped onto the premises to begin to engage the salvation that was promised for the nation for hundreds of years ago. Yes, Lord. And that's the porthole that he entered in through. And we can begin to look, you can now begin to look in the different cities and the different states how salvation is changing. How people are coming into Christ. Mm -hmm. Because there's a dimension that shifted and people are beginning to open up their hearts to who he actually is. Now, first of all, religion is fading away. Yes. Because religion is the only thing that can prevent you from giving your life to Jesus. Right. Now, I don't know if you understand that. I'll explain it to you. Uh, I love uh, chocolate. How many of you love chocolate? Come on, you can't lie to me. I mean, that's ridiculous. If you don't love chocolate, I will lay hands on you. Because it's, 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 a, it's a universal love, right? <laughs> but if I have to take your favorite chocolate, wrap it up in vomit, yummy. How many of that? It doesn't matter how much you love that chocolate, you're not going to want it. Right? It's just not going to happen. I mean, I, I love a, a specific chocolate from South Africa called, uh, I can't even remember what it's called anymore. Can you remember what it's called? I'm trying to think of it. Right. <laughs> arrow. It's an arrow. Okay, I love the arrow chocolate. Um, but if it's wrapped in vomit, I'm not going to want it. And I mean, I haven't had it in a long time. Uh, last time I had it was when uh, Darren went to South Africa. That's two years ago, right? Uh, yeah, a year, year and a half ago. That's a long time ago. <laughs> but I'm not going to eat it. And so we bring Jesus wrapped in vomit. You have to understand something. You cannot, it is literally impossible, to re reject Jesus Christ in its pure form. It's impossible. But when he's wrapped in religion, any form of religion, he's going to be rejected. Because it's wrapped in something you just don't want. Oh, you, you have to stop drinking. Okay, thanks. I don't want him. But no, don't misunderstand me. Oh, you have to stop going out to nightclubs. You have to stop sleeping around. You have to do this. You have to stop this. Have to, well, that's fine. Thank you. I'd, I'd rather go to hell. Because that's the religion talking. Jesus would never say something like that. Jesus doesn't talk like that. Matter of fact, Jesus would say, well, yeah, let's go. Let's go to a club. Let's go drink. He's not going to get drunk, but that's what he did. He was known as, a, as, a, as, a, as one that sins with the rest, although he didn't sin. But he was always in there. The church teaches you to stay away from nightclubs, get out of all these places, get a sign that says, turn or burn. <laughs> I remember going to schools in my, in my early years of ministry and I would preach message and it was, listen, you can still smoke, you can still drink, you can do everything you used to do. You must remember this is a lifestyle. It's not going to change without accept Jesus. Right? It's, not, it's not changing because I accept Jesus. It's not, not changing because I'm presented with Jesus. I have to accept Jesus first and then it's going to change. But when it's presented to me that you have to stop drinking, I remember going to church and saying, well, you know, if you don't stop drinking, you're not a child of God. If you don't stop sleeping around, you're not a child of God. And all this stuff is true. But if I'm not a child of God and I'm doing all those things, and you're telling me that I have to stop all those things, then I don't want Jesus. That's why if you're saying, well, you know, you're going to hell because of what you did. Yeah. I'd rather go to hell than to hang out with you. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's just what I've heard out there many, many times. Exactly. Uh, so we're beginning to understand that the angelic is literally there to bring us to a place of focus so that what needs to come into full fruition in whatever the situation is can get aligned with what the Father wants to do. You guys okay?
Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? When the mentoring morning star uh, sang together and the sons of God shouted for joy. <coughs> You'll find plenty of people who have some experience of the angelic through many, uh, though many Christians are very nervous when it comes to interacting with angels. And it's because of our subconscious belief that you cannot interact with angels. Let me tell you something. Jesus and Yahweh, God in his full capacity, he engages with angels all the time, every single day. Matter of fact, the Bible says, at his throne, there's a hundred million angels. Now let me tell you, when, you're, when there's a hundred million angels around your throne, and you're God, and you don't react or, or engage with them, there's something seriously wrong with you. <laughs> We're created in His image, in His likeness. Right. And they are created for us to engage so that they can help us and propel us. Sure. I remember driving over the Twin Span Bridge. And I was just engaging with Yahweh on my way to the meeting, yeah. And all of a sudden, it was uh, like a dark vortex of uh, clouds happening right in front of me. And within this vortex, there was a multitude of of angels, of thousands and thousands of angels. It looked chaotic, and it was like they were spinning around. It looked like just thousands and thousands and thousands of angels in this cloud of vortex. So I say vortex, but it looked like it was spinning like this. <coughs> As I looked up on this, I heard the Father saying, I need to teach my people how to work with angels. I need you to get to understand how to work with what I have placed at your beck and call. Right. And immediately my spirit went up to the top of this cloud and expanded over it, and as I started expanding over it and looked down, everything fell into perfect order. Yeah. And slowly but surely I began to look at these angelic beings, and I would send them out to the different places and nations that they had to go to. And the Father made it very clear to me, he said, my people don't know how to work with these beings, because if they did, things will fall into place. Right. So really it's just longing for a company of people that would begin to understand what it means to engage with the angelic. It's not a problem. <laughs> it's because they're not physical and we have never experienced the spiritual the way the Father is opening it up to us now. It's not supposed to be a scary thing. And of course, many times we will engage in the, in the natural and see things in the spiritual and think it's demonic because it's our first response. I remember being in a friend of mine's house. We lived there for a year before we came to when we were, when we came to America, and there was a interesting thing that happened in that house. There was a movement, and there was a scene. A little girl. Now, what a Hannah, my little girl. She was still a baby. And uh, in the beginning, everybody thought it was demonic, but I didn't think it was demonic. I didn't think that she was a, demon, a demon in any way, fashion, or form, because I felt the presence when I saw her, and it was several times, until I started engaging with this being in the house and realized that it was just an angelic being. They come in many different forms, many different shapes. Big, tall, sometimes it's not even an actual being in any way. It doesn't even look like, so it comes in, in winds, and fires, and flames. Listen to this, Hebrews 1. It says, and, the, and of the angels, he says, who make his angels wind, and his ministers a flame of fire. And they are not all, are they not all ministering spirits sent out to render service for the sake of those who will inherit salvation? Listen to me, there's nothing else on, on the planet that will render salvation except me and you. Dogs and cats and animals don't need to get saved. Demons are not going to get saved. Angels don't need to get saved. We are the only ones that need salvation, and they are here to render a service to us. We should engage them, and they are incredible. One of my, some of my best conversations I've ever had on this planet was with angels driving from one meeting to another in my car. I, I remember driving... To Lafayette, and I kept hearing a slapping of something slapping in the wind against my car. So eventually, I mean, I didn't understand what was going on because there's nothing that could make that sound in my car or outside my car 
So I had my spirit just shifted out of my body and around the car, and there was an angel holding on to the roof. <laughs> and I said to her, I said, what are you doing? She said, I'm coming with you. Yeah. I remember at that specific meeting, I was in the spirit, and um, I was engaging with three angels in the kingdom of heaven, and we were talking about things happening in Lafayette, changes have taken place, and all of a sudden I heard this sound, Twah! and I saw his face smashed into it, looked like a window, and he fell to the ground. And the angels stopped talking, and they said, idiot. <laughs> and I realized I was a demonic entity that cannot come into the atmosphere of the realm that we were in, that tried to engage in what we were saying, thinking that he still had access, and he doesn't. Now, this is just small encounters I've had. It's not that there's major ones I've had and I've already spoken about and I will spoke about, speak about again as we go deeper into this teaching. But I need to understand <coughs> that engaging with angels is not a sin, it's not a problem. Matter of fact, mm -hmm. it's, it's called upon for, for us today. It's the Father's desire. Mm -hmm. You know, I remember standing in the very first encounter I had, I was standing in the kingdom of heaven and an angelic being stood right in front of me and he didn't introduce himself to me or anything. He looked at me and said, I have to have you meet this man. And um, he introduced me to Noah the very first time I met him. He, I shook Noah's hand and a lot of stuff happened ever since that engagement. But it was an angel that led me there. And it didn't take anything away from Yahweh. It didn't take anything away from my worship time with, with my king. But it was the space that I needed to grow in and it was the angelic that led me to engage with Noah, that took me to a deeper place in Yahweh to get to know more of him. Yes, yes. Now, for those who are new here, I have, we, will, we will understand that everything in the kingdom of heaven is there to propel you to a deeper place. That's right. yes. uh, we engage with the saints of old, the men in white linen, we engage with the 22 yes. letters, we engage with the 24 elders, with the seraphim and the cherubim, we engage with the seven spirits, we engage with everything that's in the heaven so that we can be propelled. Yes. That's his desire. His, his will for me and you is to go to a deeper place in him. Yes. I don't know about you, but that's exciting, right? They stand up. I, I don't know what happened to the time tonight. I, mean, I haven't even started my notes yet. <laughs> I read like literally too long. <laughs> Father, we just want to give you praise and honor. We want to honor the angelic tonight. Father, we're not praising you. I don't even want to go into that. That's just ri ridiculous thinking. We thank you for the angelic, Father. We know the value of each angel and what you have sent into creation, Father, how they are there to propel us. And it all leads to bringing honor and worship and, and to glorify and to magnify you because they help us in our walk. They teach us about your character, your personality. They teach us about who you are. They show us the power and the glory. Father, they are our guardians. They are, they are powers, authorities, principalities. They guide, they lead, they are watchers. They bring us to salvation. They show us your glory. They guard over us. They lead us to our scrolls. Father, they, they bring us mandates and assignments. They are gracious. They are holy. They bring healing and, and, and they gather your people together. They are greatly anointed. And we need to begin to engage, Father. They bring provision, mantles. They show us how to worship. They introduce us to the, the treasury of heaven. They bring a fragrance. A fragrance. They bring revival. Yeah. They open up portholes. They bring us to understand deliverance and to walk through it. They, are warn they bring us warnings. They have wisdom. They are pillars that we can lean against. They have the ability to hunt and bring destruction to demonic. Yes. And they also reap. They are the ones that bring the harvest in. Father, I pray that we'll begin to understand that they are there to help us. And we are more than just ones who go to church on Sunday and read the Bible a little bit, try and memorize some scriptures, pray to uh, forgive our sins and meet our needs. We are legislators living in the kingdom of heaven that has to align creation. And that's what the angels bring us to. We have to take back mountains. We have to destroy the works of the enemy, Father. We have to get him back under our feet and take back everything that he had in the hands. He does not have a kingdom. That kingdom that he has belongs to us, and we have to take it back. 
It is the kingdom of light. That is the moment is in the, in the hands of the darkness of this world. And we're taking it back. He has no ground to stand on. As a matter of fact, he is slipping. His hands are slipping. His grip is getting weaker because sons and daughters are beginning to engage with the angelic, beginning to engage with the heavens, and we are legislating into place all that's taking back what the enemy has in hand, and it's changing the nation. So, Father, I ask you in the name of the Yeshua that you open up our hearts and pour into us the things that we need to know regarding the angelic. We have a couple of weeks left regarding what they bring and who they are, and I pray for your revelation. I pray that we will open up our hearts towards it, and we will begin to engage with it, and be reminded that we are not taking worship from you, we're not taking any time away from you when we engage with the angelic Father. We love you. We praise you, Yeshua. You're an incredible, beautiful, majestic God. And we love you. Thank you, my King. Amen.